So it's my pleasure to introduce you Dr. Kylie Limbach, who received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Central Methodist University in, in Fayette, Missouri. By the way, she's between her second and third year at KCU, serving as an anatomy fellow on the Kansas City campus. She will complete her third year clinical clerkship in Topeka, Kansas. Soon Dr. Limbach is currently involved in a cadaveric research project and two COVID-related medical education research projects. She's undecided on a specialty at present, but is interested in discovering more about radiology and orthopedic surgery. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, spending time with friends and family, and reading. Soon Dr. Limbach, take it away. All right, hi everybody. Let's see if I can get this shared. Awesome. All right. Um, so as Dr. Scheininger said, this is my cadaveric research project. Um, it's titled Danger Zone for Paramean Forehead Flap Elevation, Maximizing Flap Length and Viability. Um, if you attended the KCU symposium oral presentations, you might have heard some of this before. Uh, but due to the differences in length, uh, this has a lot more background information and really um, jumps into the details of my research project. Um, so here's my abstract for anybody with a rubric. It is 247 words long, so you don't have to like move that. Um, and you can see in the bottom right corner, I have my IBC protocol number. Um, so to understand my research project, an understanding of the basic forehead anatomy is essential. The supratrochlear artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery, which is the first branch off the internal carotid artery. This artery travels through the supraorbital margin, either through a supertrochlear foramen or a supertrochlear notch. The supertrochlear artery supplies blood to the forehead and scalp and contributes to scalp anastomosis with the supraorbital artery. And you can see here um, in this basic picture, just the supertrochlear artery, which is the main artery of my discussion. Um, the supraorbital artery is here. You can also see the superficial temporal artery, which I mentioned briefly later. And the main musculature I'm going to focus on is the frontalis muscle. So as the supertrochlear artery ascends the forehead, it changes tissue planes, and that's important for my research. So on the bottom third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery travels above the periosteum. In the middle third of the forehead, uh, it travels within the frontalis muscle. And in the top third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery travels through the subcutaneous fat. So here's just a really simple breakdown of a paramedian forehead flap procedure um, that either plastic surgeons or dermatologists with a fellowship perform. And this is the basic procedure I did for my research. So an indication for a paramedian forehead flap would be a facial defect reconstruction. Um, these are most commonly for like defects caused by removing skin cancers from the nasal tip. So here in this first picture, you can see the defect on the nasal tip. So the first step in this procedure is to create clean margins of your defect and also identify the arterial path. Next, the surgeon uses a tool, typically it's gauze, to make sure they get the correct flap length. So you use the gauze from the inner eyebrow basically to all the way to cover the defect. And this is a really important step I don't wanna underemphasize because if you make the flap too short, and it doesn't cover the defect you're aiming to uh, cover, it really impacts the patient because now they have a, a wound on their face and probably scars that they didn't need to have. So the measurement of the flap length is very important for patient outcomes. So once you get the um, correct gauze length, you rotate the gauze on the pedicle to determine how far you have to go up the forehead for this tissue flap. And then you outline your flap. As you can see here, um, the, the distal portion of the flap changes depending on what kind of defect you're trying to cover up, whether it's on the nasal tip or the nasal ala. Um, I didn't really focus on the distal part of the flap for my project. I just want to point it out because this flap does look different than the flaps I'll be showing you later on my cadavers. Okay, so once you have the outline for your flap, you take um, a scalpel and cut your flap and then rotate the tissue flap on its pedicle to cover the nasal uh, defect. After that, you attach um, it to the nasal defect and to the new vasculature. 
This is important to have vasculature that you just um, attached it to while maintaining the supertrochlear arteries vasculature because it helps the, the new flap heal faster for the patient and um, decreases the procedure time over the weeks that you you'll be amending this flap. Um, next, uh, the margins of the wound you created need to be um, approximated. And depending on the flap length, this might occur through primary or secondary healing. So a pedicle division is performed three weeks postoperatively to allow sufficient neovascularization. At this point in time, um, surgeons consider flap thinning and sculpting, as well as cartilage graphing, um, just to make sure you really want uh, this outcome to really match the patient's face. Since, since it's on their face, we really want a good cosmetic outcome. Um, I would also like to state as a warning, the next two slides and then thereafter contain graphic images of a paramedian forehap in a real patient. So just beware. So here you can see in this patient, uh, he had a nasal tip defect. Um, and then here in the middle, you can see partway through the procedure where they had created a paramedian forehead flap and covered the defect. You can see the scar from where they did this from the, the forehead. And here in the final picture, you can really see that this patient had a great outcome. The nose looks perfectly normal. The only effect he really has is just a tiny scar on his forehead. Um, this slide just has an additional example with a different defect. So this patient had a nasal ala um, defect and once again, they just removed from the forehead and attached it there. And he also had a pretty good outcome. His, you can hardly tell that he had a facial procedure. So the supertrochlear artery demonstrates clinically relevant anatomical variability that impacts the utilization and success of facial reconstruction with a paramedian forehead flap. Surgical parameters, including branching pattern variations of the supertrochlear artery, and the distance of the supertrochlear artery to the midline have been well established. However, the location and variability of the supertrochlear artery pedicle has not been described adequately in the literature thus far. In this study, we aim to triangulate the location of the supertrochlear artery pedicle relative to known anatomical landmarks and outline a danger zone during dissection, aiding the surgeon in creating maximum flap length and mobility while limiting pedicle disruption and flap compromise. So here's just another disclaimer that there will be cadaveric images in the coming slides. And for the privacy of the deceased and their loved ones, all cadaveric images have been made unidentifiable. So here um, in this uh, picture, you can see the different tissue planes that the supertrochlear artery goes through. So in the inferior one third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery is located along the pedicle. In the middle third, it's located within the frontalis muscle. And in the superior one third of the forehead, the supertrochlear artery is in the subcutaneous fat. You can also see in this picture, the black mark I made for where I found the pedicle. And you can also see that as I kept doing this procedure, I got way better at it. So the left part is a little shaky, but this right one really demonstrates the tissue planes much better. So the supertrochlear artery is vital for paramedian facial flaps, which are utilized for a variety of facial procedures. Vascular disturbances of the supertrochlear pedicle may disrupt blood flow to the constructed tissue flap. And disruption of the blood flow to the paramedian forehead flap may lead to ischemia of the tissue flap and result in flap failure. Creating maximum amount of flap length generated by freeing the flap as close as possible to the pedicle can improve patient outcomes by allowing the flap to reach far away defects rather than using a free skin graft and cause less tension on the flap, which allows better cosmetic outcomes for the patient. Precise isolation of the pedicle from known landmarks may help surgeons maximize flap length while still preserving blood supply and maintaining flap viability. So in previous studies, um, there's been a lot of research around the paramedian forehead flap. Um, a few studies have covered to determine the best forehead artery to use in paramedian forehead flaps. Um, so using the supertrochlear artery versus the superorbital artery versus even the superficial temporal artery. Other studies have looked at locating the average distance from midline of the supertrochlear artery. 
This was found to be 1.7 to 2.2 centimeters in multiple studies. Other studies have determined the hemodynamic changes in perimedian forehead flap with respect to influential factors such as age, gender, and smoking. However, my deep dive into previous research surrounding the supertrochlear artery and perimedian forehead flaps, no research has been conducted to identify the average location of the supertrochlear pedicle. So my hypothesis for this study was through the usage of commonly known and external anatomical landmarks, a surgical danger zone can be created to aid surgical isolation of the supertrochlear artery pedicle. So for our methods, um, for inclusion, we included all embalmed and fresh frozen cadavers and also included all ages, races, and sexes of the cadavers. For exclusion, um, we mainly just excluded cadavers that had forehead damage. So one example of this is whenever um, the skull cap removed, if it was cut too low to the, like, close to the eyebrows and disrupted the pedicle, we couldn't use that. Also, sometimes when removing skull tap, uh, skull caps, the tissue was pulled um, from the bone on the forehead and that also disrupted the pedicle. So those were our exclusion criteria. A large inclusion and small exclusion allowed us to replicate real populations as closely as possible in this research project. Um, and so far, our first step for creating this uh, procedure, we did a paramedian forehead flap outline. So here you can see an example of that. Um, the black marker marked our facial midline. We then used a blue marker to, which was 1.5 centimeter, 1.7 centimeters from midline, marking the average supertrochlear artery location. We then measured 0 0.07 on both sides of the blue mark to create the correct width for the forehead flap. And as I stated earlier, we weren't very concerned with like the distal end of the flap. So we just made a straight flap all the way around. And then the green marker you can see over here is 2.7 centimeters from midline, which marks the average superorbital neurovascular bundle area. So next in our methods, we use a scalpel to trace the red marker line and create the paramean forehead flap, cutting through the skin, forehead musculature, and periosteum. And then with a freer elevator, we lifted the periosteum off the bone. And if you're not a plastic surgeon, you're probably not familiar with a freer elevator, but here's a image of one on the side of the slide. Um, it's pretty specific to forehead flaps or flaps in general, sorry. So as approaching the pedicle, um, we move the freer elevator in smaller motions as to just not, not to disrupt the pedicle. Once we found the pedicle, we mark the supertrochlear pedicle with a black marker. That way we can measure from it later. We also created a square cut that avoids the green marker for access to the supraorbital neurovascular bundle without disruption. And we weren't very specific in our measurements for that. We just really made sure to avoid disrupting the supraorbital neurovascular bundle. So here you can see some stages of creating this flap. Um, we just started at the top and pulled down while working with the freer elevator to lift the periosteum off the bone, as you can see here. And then um, creating that black dot once I found the pedicle to mark it. But then because of some of the measurements were lower, we did have to free the flap all the way. So to triangulate a danger zone surrounding the supertrochlear artery pedicle, four measurements were taken. The midline to supertrochlear pedicle, which is a standard that has previously been described as 1.7 to 2.2 centimeters, served as our control. Um, we also measured the supraorbital neurovascular bundle to the supertrochlear pedicle, the bony orbital rim to the supertrochlear pedicle, and the medial canthus to the supertrochlear pedicle. And all measurements were recorded within Excel. So here you can see in these next couple slides, me performing the measurements. So in the left image are marking the midline to the location of the supertrochlear pedicle, which if you look close, you can see it's that black dot. Um, you can also see in this particular measurement, it was 1.6, which is really close to the average of 1.7. And then in the right screen, it's the superorbital neurovascular bundle to the pedicle being marked. And it's difficult to see in this image because the coloration of the bundle and this uh, tissue is pretty similar, but. 
Okay, and here on the left slide, you can see the bony orbital rim to the supertrochlear pedicle marking. And in the right slide, you can see the medial canthus to the supertrochlear pedicle marking. And those were our, our four measurements we took. So these measurements were obtained bilaterally on 38 cadavers at Kansas City University and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. To limit errors, researcher consistency was used. So student Dr. Kindle did all measurements for the outline and also did all outline marking. Whereas student Dr. Limbach did the actual surgical procedure and did all the digital caliber measurements. Data was tallied in Excel and it's statistically analyzed using chi-square analysis. So for our results, the means and range of each measurement were used to create a surgical dissection danger zone. The measurement means and standard deviation were as follows. Facial midline to pedicle was 1.69 centimeters plus or minus 0.14 with a range of 1.3 to 2 centimeters. Superorbital neurovascular bundle to pedicle was 1.5 centimeters plus or minus 0.37 with a range of 0.6 to 2.27. Orbital rim to pedicle was 1.53 centimeters plus or minus 0.38 with a range of 0.6 to 2.2 centimeters. And the medial canthus to pedicle was 3.05 centimeters, plus or minus 0.37, with a range of 2.3 to 3.8 centimeters. Of the 38 cadavers utilized for the study, 20 were male and 18 were female, so we had very similar numbers across sexes. 35 of the specimen were embalmed cadavers, and the other three were fresh cadavers. No significant differences were found between right-sided and left-sided measurements with a P being greater than 0.05. So preserving the supertrochlear artery pedicle is vital to creating a viable tissue plat for a variety of facial procedures. Vascular disturbances of the supertrochlear pedicle may disrupt blood flow to the constructed tissue flap. This complication may lead to ischemia of the tissue flap and result in flap failure. Additionally, maximizing flap mobility can be paramount to reach difficult defects such as the nasal tip and camilla. And precise isolation of the pedicle from known landmarks may help surgeons maximize flap length while still preserving blood supply and maintaining flap viability. So there were a few limitations for our study. Um, first, we had a limited number of cadavers with the end being a total of 73. Um, also, possible anatomical changes after death or during the embalming process, which is kind of hard to avoid in a cadaveric study. Also, um, limited paramedian forehead flap procedure experiences. As I am not a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist, I did not perform this on live people before, so the cadavers were my first experience. Um, so for future directions, um, project recreation to verify results consistency can be done. Also, possible usage of other anatomical landmarks, such as the nasal tip and nasion. Um, our landmarks were chosen because to create a clean surgical field, you don't really want a lot of the face showing. So we tried to use landmarks that you could see during the procedure as it stands um, to help the surgeon be able to visualize this. So in summary, the supertrochlear artery demonstrates clinically relevant anatomical variability that impacts the utilization and success of facial reconstruction with a paramedian forehead flap. Surgical parameters, including branching pattern variations of the supertrochlear artery and the distance of the supertrochlear artery to midline are well established. However, the location and variability of the supertrochlear artery pedicle has not been described adequately in the literature to date. This study triangulated the location of the supertrochlear artery pedicle relative to known anatomical landmarks and outlined a danger zone during dissection, aiding the surgeon in creating maximum flap length and mobility while limiting pedicle disruption and flap compromise. To triangulate a danger zone surrounding the supertrochlear artery pedicle, measurements from the supraorbital neurovascular bundle, bony orbital rim, and the medial canthus to the supertrochlear artery flap pedicle were obtained bilaterally on 38 cadavers at the Kansas City University and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. The facial midline supertrochlear artery pedicle, a standard which has been described previously as 1.7 to 2.2 centimeters, 
was also measured to serve as our control. Data was tallied in Excel and statistically analyzed using chi-square analysis. The means and range of each measurement were used to create a surgical dissection danger zone. Of the 38 cadavers utilized for the study, 20 were male and 18 were female, with 35 of the specimens being embalmed cadavers and the other three fresh cadavers. No significant differences were found between right-sided and left-sided measurements. Preserving the supertrochlear artery pedicle is vital to creating a viable tissue flap for a variety of facial procedures. Vascular disturbances of the supertrochlear artery pedicle may disrupt blood flow to this constructed tissue flap. This complication may lead to ischemia of the flap and result in flap failure. Additionally, maximum flap mobility can be paramount to reach difficult defects such as the nasal tip and camella. And precise isolation of the pedicle from known landmarks may help surgeons maximize flap length while still preserving blood supply. So in conclusion, this study has established a surgical dissection danger zone for the supertrochlear artery pedicle as it relates to elevation and creation of the paramedian forehead flap. Using these measurements, the facial reconstructive surgeon can prevent uh, pedicle violation while maximizing flap length and mobility to optimize safety and efficacy in this operation. And here you can see in this figure just an outline of what our surgical dissection um, danger zone looks like. Here being midline, medial canthus, the supraorbital neurovascular bundle, which in this case is coming through a supraorbital notch, and the um, orbital rim. So for presentations and journals, this research project was previously presented as both a poster and an oral presentation at the KCU Research Symposium. And recently, this ab an abstract was accepted for the, a poster presentation at the Plastic Surgery The Meeting, which is a national annual plastic surgery conference in Boston on October 25th or 27th through 30th of this year. So possible journal publications include Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, which is the journal associated with Plastic Surgery The Meeting, Journal of Plastic Reconstructive Anesthetic Surgery, and also Dermatologic Surgery, since paramedian forehead flap surgery is performed by both plastic surgeons and dermatologists. And here are my references. Um, I would just like to conclude with a few acknowledgements. Thank you to Dr. Sirk and student Dr. Kindle for helping me prepare and perform these cadaveric dissections. Thank you to Dr. Dennis for helping me with the paper and research procedures. Also, thank you to Dr. McCumber for allowing us to perform research at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And finally, a big thank you to all donors and their families for their unmeasurable gift and to the KCU Gift Body Program for allowing cadaveric research. Um, thank you for allowing me to present. I would also like to know if you have any suggestions for additional statistics I should run, please let me know. My background in statistics is pretty limited, so I essentially ran the same statistical tests that other papers surrounding surgical danger zones used, so I would take any advice in this area. And once again, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, soon Dr. Limbach, we appreciate you. I see Dr. Johnston's hand up. Go ahead, Dr. J. Thank you, sir. Um, Kylie, that's excellent, well done. I commend you or commend you on your quality of your slides and the clarity of how you uh, explain things. Um, that, it was very, very good. Um, I have some fundamental questions and um, very el elementary, but uh, take me through this. When you saw, when we saw the lesion on the gentleman's nose or <clears throat> in that area, uh, you labeled that as A, then another one was B, then another one is C. So kind of a before, then during, and then after. Um, what's the time frame of that, that transition of C the lesion, do the flap, and post? What, what's the time frame? Um, so that does depend on the deep, how big the defect is and how big the flap is. But in my research, it showed most of the time the procedure, after the procedure, you do follow up in um, minor procedure details. And usually you're done um, about three to four weeks after the original procedure. Okay, so all of that from a cosmetic perspective is in within uh, maybe a month period of time, assuming that uh, 
not as not 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 bigger. Yes. Right. Yeah, allowing originally the two vascularization points for the tissue flap. So the original vascularization that you're trying to hook up from the nose and then while keeping the pedicle attached through the supertrochlear artery really allows it to heal a lot faster than just doing a free tissue. Okay, that's good. The other question was, as you went through this and looked up a variety of variations, et cetera, what was it that you found that kind of surprised you? as you were doing this project? Um, so one of my biggest surprises was like what you just asked, um, how quickly it can be done. Um, another surprise was how well it looks afterwards. Um, as I showed in those two uh, real um, patient pictures, it really heals really well when done correctly. Um, you just usually have like a minor scar on your forehead, but the nose defect is completely gone. Yeah. and. That's part of the reason I got really excited about this project because the patient outcomes are great. So just improving patient outcomes with the different flap lengths, um, I was trying to help in that aspect. Okay. The other component to, to my question was we went back to see this um, patient number, patient A who had this lesion. I guess, was that a cancer or do we know? Um. So this first patient, he did yeah. have just like a, a simple squamous cell carcinoma on the tip of his nose. Okay. But th this other patient, it didn't specify. Um, in okay. The so with regard to the squamous cell, go back a slide. What, is that a post uh, uh, moles procedure, meaning uh, going back, excising the bigger chunk and depth and width is that is that what we're looking at or is this just the lesion there I believe this picture over here on the left is before even cleaning the margins okay so the Mohs procedure would have some bearing on what size of flap mm -hmm. that you're going to have to put on is that right Yes. Originally, I was actually looking at Mo's procedure and trying to do um, some research surrounding that. And that's what led me into parabenum for it flaps, actually. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and my last question is, uh, is your goal to be a plastic surgeon? Uh, I don't really know what my goal is. I'm trying to keep an open mind next year. Um, like I just said, I was actually trying to look at it from a, a dermatology standpoint. Yeah. But since we have a plastic surgeon on staff, um, that being Dr. Surik, yeah. I really utilized him to help me move this project in a way I could have like a really good mentor. Very good. Well, please tell Dr. Surik, uh, uh, thank him for uh, helping you on this. Uh, you did an excellent job. Well done. That's all I have, Dr. Steininger. Uh, Life-changing stuff, no question about it. Yep. Um, Professor Dennis, I saw your hand up momentarily. Uh, that was the clap, the clap oh, reaction, because okay. I was saying, well done. Um, okay. I was going to, oh, sorry, Dr. Wolf, go ahead. Oh, uh, I, was, I was just going to ask something because I, I didn't want to leave her end after such, or quick, so quickly after a good presentation. I was curious about the, um, you know, it's pre important to preserve the arterial inflow, but how well do you actually create an outflow for it or do, you know to what extent does having a place for the blood escape and and what kind of you know when they're they're sewing it in to what extent do you utilize branches of uh those e existing micro vessels or or the little veins and stuff like that and try to anastomose some of that stuff together um i know that they do really try to hook it up to the blood supply on the nose um I don't know a lot of the details about that since it is a little heavy reading for me since I'm not actually a plastic surgeon. Um, but they really do try to keep the two vantage points of the two blood supplies to really help with the healing process. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Allinger, go ahead. Sorry. There I am. Um, like with each of the previous fellows presentations your your sample size is not a limitation 72 as a as a sample size is not at all a limitation 
And uh, again, the, doing things like cadavers, that's, that's what we do. So also not a limitation. If you feel like you need to list it, you can, but you don't really need to. You not being a plastic surgeon, yeah, that makes sense as a limitation. But the other two, not really limitations. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? If not, let's wrap it up and thank student Dr. Limbach for such an excellent presentation. Nice work, we'll, Kylie. Thank we'll you look all. forward to uh, next week's presentation. I uh, hope to see you all there. Appreciate you guys. Take care. Have a great weekend. Yes. Thank you.